Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Lloyd and welcome to No Budget Reviews, the series where we go around the country finding cars that you can buy in good condition with an MOT for under a thousand pounds and filming them with absolutely no money at all. So we have to use my phone, no microphones, no fancy DSLRs, nothing like that. Just good honest cars that you can buy for very little money and you can enjoy driving. Well, viewers, never let it be said to you that we don't bring you some real treats on no-budget reviews. This is a 1992 Kia Pride 1.3 LX. You probably would have seen this car on the internet before. It was driven by Steph, my driver classic, in September 2019. And with, you know, as so many of cars we feature on no-budget reviews at the moment, this is owned by Jude. This actually was... I think his first car, I think he learned to drive in this. The Kia Pride has a very interesting kind of history. It was Kia's first car that was marketed um, actually uh, to people in the United Kingdom from 1991. This is an August 92 car and it is sort of, I would say, launch spec. It's not a 1.1 litre, which was the small engine, um, it was only sold for a few years. This is a 1.3 that went in most Kias. If you're from America, you might, rec you might recognize this car as a Ford for Steve, but I think they mainly sold that at a three-door version. In this country, we got three and five-door versions. This was basically, um, for our markets anyway, the successor to the Mazda 121, or rather a continuation of the Mazda 121. Because in 1991, Mazda released this really weird sort of kind of Austin A35 looking thing, um, which was completely different than this. This went into production in 1986. Uh, as the Festiva and the Mazda 121 and it had a very very long production life variants of this car actually continued until this very year in Iran it's funny to see this, this is this is genesis as far as Kia is concerned in this country they made other cars as well like the uh, Kia Breezer which was a um, Mazda but this was the debut car that they choose to launch with in 1991 and at that particular time these cars were sharing space with the Salpenza, which was a, a rebadged previous generation Mazda 323 made in South Africa, and the Asia Rockstar, which is a sort of Jeep thing. Um, I think it was just basically later called the Kia Rockstar. These prides are very, very rare. Uh, you might have seen actually a, a Mark II pride on the Lorry's Mechanical Marvels channel. Um, which has been bought for whenever they do their next uh, Lemons Challenge, but this is a very early Mark I Pride. If we take a look inside, there's just nothing to this car at all, which I think is one of the things that appeals to Jude so much about it. Because we, this has got an LX, we've got luxury things like a rev counter. We don't get air conditioning because, well, yeah, they decided that in this country we didn't need it, so we didn't get it, so that's what it would have been. And we have possibly what's the worst blanking plug I've ever seen in my life. Lots of the space for storing your cassettes and a genuine factory fitted Kia um, stereo. We've got a digital clock that works. In this early car, of course, we don't get things like power steering. We don't get um, electric windows. We don't get electric mirrors, although you can adjust them internally, unlike the Proton I used to have. In fact, this whole dashboard does remind me of, of a Proton, because uh, it's about the same era as the Mitsubishi Colt, or Lancer Fiore, depending on what part of the world you're from, which the, the original Protons were based on. And this being an, a mid-80s Mazda design, means that this is very, very 80s kind of Japanese, um, even if, you know, this car is, is from 1992. Glove box and this car is full of all sorts of interesting cassettes and more cassettes on the top. I'm sure, Mr. Richardson, furious driving, would find himself. He's got a tea shelf up there in classic Japanese style. I'd say Mazda style because I used to have a 1997 Mazda 323F 1.5 inch special edition, and in that one, the indicators on the right and the wipers were on the left, just like in this car. Very clear instruments, reminiscent of so many Japanese manufacturers in the 1980s. Seats, uh, 
actually not as uncomfortable as I thought it would be. But a very, very cheap car. I thought the seat would be terrible. And actually, it's not. I'll be, see what power stone is like in a second. I must remember not to put the wipers on when I'm indicating when we go out for a test drive a little bit later. Some door pockets on here, but it's all very, very kind of 1980s Japanese basic car, like a original Subaru Justy and stuff like that. It's very charming indeed. Later on, we'll talk about some of the countries in which this car was made, because there are a lot of them. So if we go around this side, because that's where my stuff is, so we'll go around this side. I think I've unlocked the door. Yes, I have no central locking, of course. Because the car's quite tall, it's it's quite easy to get in and out. Actually, there's quite a lot of headroom in here. There's a surprising amount of headroom. And I've even got some legroom. This is really, really good. I was expecting this to be terrible, but it's not. Um, that's a real surprise. It's not, the angle of the seat isn't that comfortable, but in comparison with like a, I don't know, a um, Vauxhall Nova or, or a Mark II Fiesta, there's a lot more room in here. That's quite surprising. Wow. I mean, there's not an awful lot in here, but that's pretty good, actually. I'm surprised. Uh, split folding seats straight down the middle, 50-50. That button in the middle where it always gets tangled up and sort of you have the passengers fighting over uh, belt buckles. And then, of course, the fuel flap, which is just on a key. I imagine uh, that uh, the boot is like that as well. And, of course, typical early 90s uh, Japanese and Korean cars. We've got a little bit of rust on the side, but you tell me a Japanese car from this era that doesn't have a problem with corrosion on the wheel arches, like on this side. So let's have a look in the boot. As you can see, we've actually got a decent amount of stuff in this boot. It's um, probably 180, 200 litres. It's not massive, but this is really designed as a car for nipping around little little Japanese cities. Um, of course, with, Europe, with the European regulations, we have a separate fog light on here. Um, I can't remember if the later Mark II's got fog light integrated into the, into the um, rear lights. I'm sure Jude will tell me in a, in a moment. Um, we have just used the um, internal boot release. There actually is one in this car, unlike what I said earlier. And we've even got a little place where you can put the windscreen washer fluid in. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a little bit loose. So we've just used the internal one. Original dealer plates, of course, on this car. Um, not sold not far away from here at all in Croydon. That's not, not a long time it's travelled at all. Um, the mileage is just under 60,000 miles. Brilliant. So here we have the carburetted 1.3-litre Mazda B-series engine, which generates 63 horsepower. This car didn't get a fuel injection until 1994. So, yes, I don't know how we've got, got away with, with the engine with an auto choke um, and the carburetor to, uh, with, to pass the Euro 1 regulations and to make it run with the Catholic Red properly, but somehow we did. Classic Mazda uh, oil filler cap on this car as well. Loads and loads and loads of room to work on. I think this was the biggest engine available. There was another 1.3 available um, in the 121 in Japanese market, but uh, as far as I know, there was, a, there was this engine 1.1, the Japanese 1.3 as well, and that was about it. Right, I think it's time for a test drive. Okay, viewers, Jude is with me for this one, which is very nice of him. Oh my gosh, no power steering. It's not as bad as that Maestro though was. That was, that was heavy, viewers. Um, so we're going to go for a little drive, and um, I will be sparing with my wiper usage because I think the blades don't particularly like me today. Just very, very just classic, what, what Chris Goffey called in 1991, early Japanese style, and um, he wasn't wrong. There we go, and wipe, the windscreen wiper is on there. Just everything about this car is um, just like nothing you really, you really want to see today. It's, it's very, very charming. Very, very charming indeed. I can see why Jude absolutely loves this car. Right, I might be lucky in like this enormous truck out. Yes, there we go. And of course, we've got very little in the way of safety features here, so I should be driving relatively carefully today. Gearbox is quite a long throw on it, but it's actually not too, not too bad. 
everything is nice and easy to use. I can see why in America, I think this is one of the cheapest cars you could buy in the United States of America when it was sold as the Vestiva. And um, if you just need just absolutely basic transportation, I don't think this is too bad. Certainly, I've been driving a lot of the older cars recently, like Renault 5, and um, this isn't as big as a Renault 5, I don't think. It's a little bit smaller than that. And it doesn't have quite the same feeling that that, that, that does. Um, but, you know, when we go out, we see if we get Renault 5 levels of um, levels of body lean of things. I've got to be really careful coming out of this junction, dears, because it's, um, it's very busy here today. I'll tell you what. I'll just stop the camera and we'll come back to you in a second. Eine Stunde später. Years we survived coming out of the junction. Um, the rear heated window doesn't seem to be the most. Oh, that's on. There we go. Um, I wondered why it wasn't working. Uh, there we go. Yeah, very upright driving position. I think we're going to have some body leaning today. today. One of the things about, certainly when I learned to drive about 20 years ago, which makes me very, very, very old, is that this is what people were driving, this sort of car. I know this is a 1980s car, but plenty of people I knew had first cars like, I don't know, Mark II Fiestas and Peugeot 205 and things like that. And they're very much cars of this era, and this is what people used to have. It's amazing that this car is only done just under 60,000 miles. It certainly feels nice and tight. The gearbox, despite the throw on it, it's actually much nicer in, in some ways in the gearbox than the uh, Rover 214 that you would have seen on the channel. It's also tuned. I, I, I prefer the gearbox in this actually. It feels a little bit tighter. Similar mileage on both these cars. Actually, this is slightly higher. So, um, And that's just a way with the sort of Peugeot style gearboxes. They tend to be a bit floppier than, than this Bastard one. It's just funny that Kia now, I mean, I, I recently did a walk around of um, a 2019 Kia Seed uh, diesel. I know we don't talk about those on the channel, but that's just what happened. Um, and that was so different from this. We've got very high levels of noise compared to a modern car. We've got me having to think a lot because I've got wipers and indicators on different sides, like a proton is exactly the same, you've got to think about that. Mind you, the rear-heated window is working perfectly well, which is really good for a car that's 28 years old. I just really like things like this little chirpy indicator noise and the fact that the controls are sort of tiny little switches scattered all over the dashboard, it's, um, it's just wonderful. The trim levels available in a in a Pride in this country anyway were L, which was very basic, and that was available with the 1.1 litre engine, generating an amazing 54 horsepower. Oh, listen to that! Listen to that power. <laughs> um, but LX like this. Later, I think in 1994, the L was renamed to the Start Trim. And that was uh, renamed to S, I think, for the 1998 facelift that this car had. The top model then was renamed to the SX, and you've got stuff like electric windows. Incredible luxury. I don't think these cars ever had alloy wheels available in this country at all. They were all, um, they're all kind of uh, wheel trims, and with varying degrees of success of staying on the car. This car's obviously had some wheel trims fall off at some point in its life, or maybe it didn't have any. And uh, as Jude's pointed out to me, this was the last car in this country with white wall tyres, uh, standard until 1994 and an optional until 1997. Somehow the, the look of the car quite suits it. It's probably a very Japanese thing to want white wall tyres on your little city car. Right, let's uh, wind her up and take her on the dual carriageway. We need some wiper action for that. I'm very pleased we've got a five-speed gearbox in this car. I don't think an automatic was ever available in this country. Maybe other nations got them. I know that in Germany, for example, you could buy a Kia Pride Estate, which boggles my mind, considering that, you know, we're, we're 
going up this, this motorway and the gearing's actually quite tall so I think we're going to be okay at going up 70 but I don't think that's a lot of power to warm on one of these and the camera is absolutely shaking all over the place I don't know sort of why and I apologise for it but that's clearly what happens in one of these when we go along the speed um, so that's um, that's interesting viewers me of driving something like a K11 Nissan Micro or something like that, only everything so it feels a lot more fashioned inside it. So it will cruise at 70, but I've got I've got sort of vibrations and things going on here, so it's probably not the best idea to do this in the day. It actually feels it has a stability, it feels alright, I thought it would feel worse than this, but it doesn't. And now the engine's warmed up, it's running very smoothly. Right, I think uh, we'll come back to you in a little bit and we'll change the camera angle. Une heure plus tard. Alright viewers, we're coming off the dual carriageway because um, for some reason the mount that I've got my, my camera in was just shaking all over the place so it was impossible to record much footage that was actually in any way decent but it was actually okay um, for one of these I mean I've, I've, dri I've driven worse cars like this on a motorway really um, it just reminds me so much and Jude was saying this as well because he used to own a Proton it is just like a mini Proton both are based on uh, Japanese designs from the 80s but built in the 1990s um, and both with indicators and wipers switched around and things like that. This car though has the luxury of a variable intermittent wiper pattern, which is brilliant. Yeah, Mazda B engine, it's a very reliable type of engine. you just got to remember to change the cam butt on it. And of course, people in America who have owned for Stevers, if they don't rust to pieces, then they will go on for maybe three, four hundred thousand miles if you look after them. And there is a certain charm to something like this. I mean, this is, it's not an expensive car. Um, Jude paid well under a thousand pounds for this. It was one of the classic ones where the elderly owner was given up driving at the age of 97, was it, Jude? Mm, yes. 97, uh, note left on the windscreen, and uh, later this car became his. And if you want to know about the essence of driving, bear in mind that I passed my test at a 1.1 litre Citroen Saxo with no power steering then you could do a lot worse than this. There's no safety aids or anything in this. But it's actually quite easy to drive. The power steering, or lack of it, is something you would get used to quite quickly. It reminds me of a Renault 5 in that way. The Renault 5 that we had no budget reviews quite recently, that didn't have any power steering. And you just kind of get used to things like that. The noise of everything and um, the fact that I'm, I'm sitting so high up is something unusual for me these days, but not unusual in a car like this in the 80s and 90s at all. With you know far less than 100 of these left, these, these cars are just not a common sight at all on the road. And you know, rust would have killed a lot of them, neglect. They weren't very expensive anyway, but Kia just kept selling these cars for years and years and years after the sell-by day, and people obviously kept buying them. You could buy one of these, as I, as I said, in, in, in Iran. I think the van version was the last we discontinued until this year. And then there was the strange, weird kind of uh, Renault 5 and Kia Pride hybrid thing. So it was a first-generation Renault 5 with Kia Pride underpinnings in it, which is absolutely crazy. I think the Cyper is the name of the company that used to make the Pride, and they made all kinds of versions of these. Saloons and um, three doors and five doors and things. Right, we appear to be in a traffic jam at the moment, getting into a supermarket car park, although we're not going to a supermarket car park, so I think we'll come back a little later.
Now, normally at this stage, we'd look at some uh, extra Kia Pride trim levels, but we've already covered those because I can remember them all, which is brilliant. We've also looked at the engines. There were only two, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, the 60 time of this car is apparently 11.8 seconds, which I can well believe. The assembly of this car was in Japan, South Korea, China, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, the Philippines, and Venezuela under um, a lot of different badges. And these were, are you ready for this? The Ford Festiva, Kia Pride, Mazda 121, the Cyper Pride, the Cyper 111, the Cyper 131, the Cyper 132, and the Cyper 141, the Cyper 151, the Cyper Nassim, and the Cyper Saba. In China, it was known as the Guantong GTQ 5010X. So this car was a really a world car, and the platform lasted for 34 years before its discontinuation, which is really, really um, impressive, actually. Um, I think I really want to find one of those uh, Renault 5 and Kia Pride hybrids. That might be interesting. So there we are, viewers. Should you consider a Kia Pride as a starter classic? Well, they're not very expensive. There's not very many of them left. And I wouldn't really recommend driving for very long on a motorway because it was a little bit on the terrifying side. Um, but it was it was okay. Uh, certainly around town, absolutely brilliant fun. Very easy to park, uh, despite the lack of power steering. Very easy to see out of. And uh, once you're used to the indicators and wipers being, being the other way around, it's actually not that bad. If you really want uh, a luxury model, then you can go for the facelifted one, which you might get with electric windows and mirrors, which is wonderful. But anyway, thank you ever so much indeed for watching. And uh, once again, to Jude for the loan of this car. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more episodes of Nor with no budget reviews and other automotive hijinks and general japery. Um, I've got a Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Lloyd Vehicle Consulting, um, and also an Instagram page, instagram.com forward slash Lloyd underscore vehicle underscore consulting. Thank you.